Hey everyone, I'm Riley with Dark Arrow. This video is all about galvanic corrosion and more specifically galvanic corrosion between carbon fiber and aluminum and what we're doing to address this type of corrosion on the Dark Arrow 1. From the very beginning of building the Dark Arrow 1 from carbon fiber, we had to come up with strategies to prevent or at least mitigate against galvanic corrosion. Early on, we did a bunch of testing to create accelerated galvanic corrosion conditions so that we could better understand this phenomena and come up with solutions for this issue. I wanna talk through those solutions in this video, but first let's make sure we're all on the same page and understand exactly what galvanic corrosion is and what are the mechanisms that cause it. Let's get into it. Okay, what is galvanic corrosion? Galvanic corrosion is also called bimetallic corrosion, and it occurs between two different metals that are in electrical contact with each other in the presence of an electrolyte. When these conditions are met, you can see preferential corrosion of one of the metals relative to the other one. Carbon fiber isn't a metal, but it's conductive just like metal, so it can also lead to galvanic corrosion. I'll show an example from the Dark Arrow 1, which is this carbon fiber and aluminum honeycomb sandwich panel. We've got a carbon fiber skin and an aluminum honeycomb core. And if these two materials were to make an electrical contact between each other and there was moisture present, you could see corrosion of the aluminum core. Now, the aluminum core is uncorroded, it's still there, which means we must have figured out a way around this. I'll tell you about that in a minute, but first I wanna go over the mechanisms that cause galvanic corrosion. I think this is really important to cover, so we're gonna go over to the marker board to discuss that in more detail. Okay, I have all the key information drawn out on the marker board here. I know this looks like a lot, but I'm gonna break this down piece by piece so that it's a lot more digestible for you. We'll start at the top here. Going back to the definition of galvanic corrosion that I mentioned earlier, there are three key conditions that need to be met in order for galvanic corrosion to occur. The first one is that you have to have two dissimilar metals. Uh, we also include carbon fiber because it's conductive even though it's not a metal. So we're gonna be focusing on aluminum and carbon fiber. And what's important is that these two dissimilar materials have different electrode potentials. I'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, these two materials need to have electrical contact between each other. Uh, basically they need to be touching and then there needs to be the presence of an electrolyte bridge between the materials we're going to focus on water for these examples because it's probably the most common uh, jet fuel or gasoline or other liquids can also function as the electrolyte bridge but we're going to keep it on track with water okay i mentioned electrode potentials what that is is basically a measurement of how much different materials want to give up or receive electrons relative to each other Scientists have measured these electrode potentials and we've classified them in charts. Some of these charts are really big, uh, but I've broken it down into a more simplified version with the materials that we're more concerned about. So they also call these charts a galvanic series chart and electrode potentials on here are measured in terms of volts. So we've got carbon fiber, titanium alloys, stainless steel alloys, and aluminum alloys. And what happens is if you have materials with different electrode potentials in contact with each other, they're gonna enter basically a little tug of war and fight over electrons between each other. Uh, that's gonna be a key mechanism that we're gonna talk about down here. So I have two samples of material drawn out here. Uh, we've got aluminum and carbon fiber, aluminum and carbon fiber. These are basically identical. And then you have to imagine that there's a little puddle of water bridging the aluminum and carbon fiber. And what happens when you have this configuration of materials, you create what's essentially a galvanic cell or a battery What's gonna happen is the aluminum is gonna function as the anode in the battery and give up electrons, and the carbon fiber is gonna function as the cathode in the battery and receive those electrons. Uh, when the aluminum starts giving up electrons, you'll have aluminum ions dissolve into your little puddle of water here. And then at the same time, this voltage difference created between the aluminum and carbon fiber uh, creates a water splitting reaction. So you have water molecules here splitting into hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions combine with electrons to form hydrogen gas, and then the uh, hydroxide ions combine with aluminum ions to form aluminum hydroxide. This ends up being kind of this uh, jelly like paste and it'll dry out into this white cakey substance on the aluminum. And we saw that in our testing. So as this is drawn, this is all an unbalanced chemical reaction. I know the chemistry buffs are gonna roast me in the comments about that. So here are the balanced chemical equations for your reference if you're interested in that. At the same time, there's another 
primary reaction that can occur, which is an oxygen reduction reaction. And it's very similar to the water splitting reaction, but we have at the same time uh, oxygen atoms getting split and then the oxygen ions combine with hydrogen ions to form hydroxide ions that also combine with the aluminum ions to form aluminum hydroxide again. Uh, again, this is unbalanced, but the balanced chemical equations are down here. So now that we've talked through all this and what's going on roughly at a molecular level, I think we can have a better approach to deciding how we're gonna try to prevent or mitigate against galvanic corrosion. You might've already thought of some strategies for this, uh, but we're gonna head over to the plane and talk through what we did to prevent or mitigate against galvanic corrosion. Hi, we're in the aft portion of the fuselage looking up. So this is the belly of the airplane. The lower fuselage skin is not attached, which allows us to see a lot of the internal structure. You can see that these bulkheads are made out of uh, carbon fiber sandwich panels with an aluminum honeycomb core, just like I showed at the beginning of the video. So the way that we prevent galvanic corrosion in these structures is we electrically isolate the carbon fiber skin from the aluminum honeycomb core with a layer of fiberglass. So I have a sample here that I've destroyed for your viewing pleasure. And you can actually see that layer of fiberglass. It's this white surface finish on the interior of the carbon fiber skin. And there's even a little scrap of it there. So this electrically isolates the skin from the core and thereby prevents any electron flow between them and also prevents galvanic corrosion. Another example of electrically isolating material can be seen in our aft electronics plate here. So what we did here is just basically painted the outside of the carbon fiber and that creates a, a non-conductive barrier between any metal and the plate itself. One key thing to note if you're going to use this method of painting to uh, electrically isolate the structure, you want to paint the cathode or the carbon fiber because uh, if you painted the aluminum, if you get a little teeny scratch in that paint coat, that could be an area of an accelerated corrosion. So always paint your carbon fiber. Another example of electrical isolation can be seen in the click bond studs and nut plates that we use throughout the aircraft to fasten hardware and accessories to the airframe. These click bonds are held in place with an epoxy adhesive, and then there's an epoxy primer on them to help promote adhesion to whatever you're trying to bond to. So between the adhesive and the primer, you get a non-conductive barrier between the click bond and the carbon fiber, and this prevents galvanic corrosion. Beyond that, the click bonds that we select are stainless steel. Stainless steel has a very low potential for galvanic corrosion with carbon fiber. This leads into the next method that we use to mitigate against galvanic corrosion, which is selection of alloys that are more compatible with carbon fiber. A good example of picking an alloy that's more compatible with carbon fiber is our titanium firewall heat shield. If you remember back to when I was talking about our galvanic series chart and electrode potentials, you'll remember that titanium and carbon fiber have a very small difference in electrode potential. And this is good from a galvanic corrosion standpoint because the smaller the difference in electrode potential between your two materials, the smaller the potential there is for galvanic corrosion. So titanium is an excellent alloy to pick if you have to have metal in contact with carbon fiber, but titanium isn't always an option. So another alternative would be stainless steel. A good example of that is the stainless steel fasteners we're using to hold the ignition coils to the firewall. Stainless steel does have a little bit higher difference in electrode potential relative to carbon fiber, but it's still a good alloy to pick for metal in contact with carbon fiber. A good rule of thumb to use if you're trying to have a metal in contact with carbon fiber is keep the difference in electrode potential below 250 millivolts. If you can do that, you have a really good shot at mitigating against galvanic corrosion. Another great example of careful material selection can be seen in these cooling inlets on the engine. Now these would be a really tempting part to make from carbon fiber since they have this complicated shape and carbon fiber is a great material to use for complicated shapes. The problem is these inlets interface with an aluminum air box that goes over the cylinders. And if this were carbon fiber, you could be introducing some potential for galvanic corrosion between the inlet and the air box. The way we get around that is we have made these inlets from nylon that has been 3D printed using an SLS process. The nylon is non-conductive, which essentially eliminates any potential for galvanic corrosion with the aluminum air box. Now, maybe you could argue this is a little bit of a cheating solution because it just boils down to not using carbon fiber. One other example that I can show of careful material selection as a solution for galvanic corrosion relates back to the honeycomb sandwich panels that I showed at the beginning of the video. So 
instead of using an aluminum honeycomb core in your structure, it's possible to use an Aramid or Nomex honeycomb core in the sandwich panel. Now this material is non-metallic and non-conductive, so it doesn't have any potential for galvanic corrosion with carbon fiber, which also means you don't need to go through the effort of incorporating a fiberglass layer to isolate this from the skin. We actually use this material in all the ribs and shear webs in the wings, horizontal stabilizer and vertical stabilizer in the Dark Arrow 1. And we use aluminum honeycomb cores right now in the fuselage bulkheads, but we're planning on changing over to this exclusively for all the sandwich panel structures once we get into production. Uh, we're doing this for a number of reasons that go beyond galvanic corrosion solutions, but again, this is a really good material to pick if you're trying to prevent against galvanic corrosion in sandwich panel structures. There are other options for preventing galvanic corrosion that we haven't used on the Dark Arrow 1, but they might be useful for you depending on what your project is. Uh, one of these options would be to completely prevent your assembly from seeing any moisture. This would be useful in an application where you can't electrically isolate the carbon fiber from your metallic structure. Uh, so what you would do is completely encapsulate your carbon fiber and aluminum in some sort of coating, which would prevent any moisture from getting to it. The disadvantage here is that you have no way to visually detect if you get any moisture into the assembly or if there's any corrosion. So that's something you need to keep in mind, but this could work depending on what your application is. One other potential solution would be to just do nothing about it. Now, before you freak out, uh, let me explain because there are some situations where this could work. Let's say you're designing a machine that's not going to have a very long life cycle. Uh, say you're building a model rocket that's going to be built uh, from a carbon fiber tube for the body and then you're going to bolt on some aluminum guide fins. Uh, you're probably just going to launch off your model rocket once or twice and then move on to a bigger and better model rocket. So in this case, you probably don't even have to worry about galvanic corrosion. Okay, so that was a high level overview of galvanic corrosion between carbon fiber and aluminum and what we're doing to address this issue on the Dark Arrow 1. Now, there are a lot more solutions beyond what we offered up in this video, and there's also a lot more to learn on this topic, so I encourage you to do some more research of your own. If you want to follow along as we build the Dark Arrow 1, subscribe to our channel, and if you want to support us, click the Join button, and you'll get to see behind-the-scenes pictures and video that we're posting almost daily. Beyond that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.